Well, today we're still transitioning out of the sermon series that we had concluded, right, uh, even before Easter. Uh, next week we're going to be starting a new sermon series, but today I wanted us to consider just, even as we looked at Psalm 27 earlier at the start of the worship, is spending time to really gaze upon Jesus, to look upon his goodness, to look at how he loves not only people then, but how he continues to love us even today. And we get a glimpse of this in Luke, and that's going to be our, our, our passage today. Luke chapter 8, uh, the second half of verse 40, 42 until 48. But what we see here is Jesus, he's on his way to heal the dying 12-year-old girl of Jairus. Uh, and on his way... He's abruptly stopped, or he abruptly stops to interact with this woman who's desperate in her own way. And we'll see how Jesus interacts with her, how he loves on her. And so turn with me again. I'll be, we'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Turn with me to Luke 8. And I'll read for us the second half of verse 42 all the way to verse 48. And once again, out of reverence for God's word, if you're able, uh, please stand as we hear God speak to us by his spirit and through his word. Luke chapter 8, verse 42. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him. There was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. Though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus says, someone touched me, for I perceive that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched them and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Let me pray for us. Father, as we read from your word, as we see you walking, interacting, loving people, Lord, we just pray that your spirit would help us to see how you love and interact with us, Lord God, still today. Uh, that this is not simply something that we're looking at from the past, but, Lord, this is something that we can consider together in the present. And so, Holy Spirit, Lord, really help us to encounter you. Help, help us to see Christ more clearly today. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. You know, if you're familiar with this section, I mean, this really could be a two-Sunday uh, sort of sermon series, right, as we consider the daughter of Jairus and then even consider this woman. Uh, but everything that Jesus says and does, as we slow down and think about how he loves this woman, it's, it's intentional. Jesus does everything with purpose. And, and we see with this woman just this hopelessness of her condition. We see the hopelessness even of her shame. But we really want to end by considering together the healer of shame. We want to consider Jesus together and how he's the healer of shame for this woman, but even also for us. Uh, you know, if you think about what, what Jesus is doing here, he's essentially responding to a 911 call that Jairus is making. My daughter is dying. I need you to come and heal her. And on the way, he's abruptly stopping for this woman. And the woman's introduced in this way, right, in verse 42, that here's this woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years. And though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. You're thinking about a condition, it's not a normal menstrual cycle that we're talking about. We're talking about this abnormal discharge of blood. 
I mean, some people speculate maybe there was like a uterine hemorrhage or some sort of condition like that. And the main point isn't that seeing physicians is a waste of money, although that can also be true. What we're seeing here is just, here's a woman for 12 years dealing with the condition where there's this persistent and painful hopelessness, right? Even physicians couldn't heal her. In Mark's account, it's described in this way, that she spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. Even in her efforts to get better, even in seeing physicians, even though she was spending all that she had so desperate, she wasn't getting better. She was actually getting worse. I mean, and you can sense the hopelessness, right, of this woman. And this is over 12 years. Uh, over 12 years. This isn't just 12 weeks. This isn't even just 12 days. 12 years of this. And it's one of those conditions where she couldn't just ignore it, you know, and compartmentalize it over here and just move on with her life. If you know anything about Jewish law and the discharge of blood, I mean, she was really hopeless in a more desperate way, even more than just in a physical sense. Because if you look to Jewish law in places like Leviticus, in chapter 15, verse 25, this is what the Jewish law says about someone who has a discharge of blood that's not normal, right? Like an abnormal discharge of blood. It says this in verse 25. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge she shall continue in uncleanness. All the days she shall continue in uncleanness. Think about that. Perpetually being unclean or something she has no control over in her own body, being unclean for 12 years. And to make matters worse, it's not only that she's unclean, in the very next verse in Leviticus 15, it says that everything that she touches gets defiled and unclean. Uh, the bed she sits on, the people that she touches. I mean, it's hard enough as it is if you're unclean, but can you imagine living day to day in that anything you touch, it doesn't turn to gold, it becomes unclean. You're, you're contagious. You're infectious. In the bad sense. And if social exclusion wasn't painful enough, even at the end there in, in Leviticus 15 and verse 31, it says, you shall keep the people of Israel separate from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness by defiling my tabernacle that is in their midst. So you're talking about whether it's the tabernacle then, the temple during, during Jesus' time. There's even this exclusion from the temple, which is where God's presence was recognized as dwelling. And I mean, in that sense, I mean, she was an outcast in every sense of that word, wasn't she? Unclean, contagious, an outcast. She couldn't even enter the temple. We really need to feel the weight of the hopelessness. How desperate this woman must have been. I mean, living like this for 12 Years and, and as we think about not only a, a medical or physical condition, but what comes along with something like this for the woman is, is this world of shame, isn't there? She's living in this world of shame. And if you think about how shame operates, uh, you can experience shame because of something that you do, right? Maybe you've sinned. Uh, maybe it's something that you failed to do, right? We talked about taking tests and exams or boards or whatever it is. Maybe there's something that you failed to do, and sometimes you're induced in this, in this world of shame as a result of that. Sometimes you experience shame because of something that happens to you. It's not something that you did, but it's something that's happened to you, something that someone else did to you. I mean, we live in a world where you can't ignore the reality of abuse in all of its forms, whether it's in your childhood whether it's as you were growing up. 
Sometimes something that happens to you fills you with shame. But for someone like this woman, it's associating, being associated with something that's shameful. Right? A discharge of blood for her. Unclean. Anything you touch becomes unclean. And if you think about this living in a world of shame, it has an isolating effect, right? You feel vulnerable. You feel exposed. You can't go near anybody. And sometimes that's just self-inflicted, right, when you're living in a world of shame. There could be a disorienting even effect, right, when you're, when you're dealing with shame. You can't tell, like, is, is this what's true or is, or is this what's false? Like, you have a hard time discerning the lies that you're telling yourself, the lies that other people may be telling you. It could be disorienting, but it's dehumanizing too, isn't it? The way that we struggle and deal with shame. It doesn't just stay in this, in this world of feelings where it looks like I feel unclean or I feel undirty or I feel dirty. You believe that that's like who you are, right? Shame has that sort of effect. Like, it's not I feel unclean, I am. And it's not only your own perception. You, you, as you're dealing and struggling with shame, you think, like, this is how other people see me. This is how God sees me. Shame can have a dehumanizing even effect. And perhaps like this woman, maybe those who are supposed to help you have failed you in the past. Maybe you've been dealing and living with shame in different ways. You know, and the question is, to whom will you turn? You know, are we just destined to just live trying to conceal the shame as we live? Maybe it's by trying to present ourselves like, look how great I am, and we try to conceal shame in that way. Are we destined to just live by being consumed by it? And the good news as we look at this woman, as we look, at, look to our Jesus, is no, there's someone that we can turn to. There is a healer of shame, and this isn't only for the woman then, this is for us today as well. You know, this woman, she doesn't cry out, you know, from afar like a blind beggar or like a leper like you see some people do in the Gospels. You see her secretly come up behind Jesus, right, just trying to touch the, ed the edge of his garment. I mean, she must have been so desperate. I mean, in the process of trying to get close to Jesus, I mean, technically she's making everyone she touches unclean as she's going to get close to Jesus, right? And she must have been so desperate. And it says in verse 44 that she touches the fringe of his garment and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. This is what Ed Welch, uh, a teacher, uh, a therapist, someone at CCEF, uh, he wrote a book couple books on shame. This is what he writes in one of them. He says, shame isolates, but it's more personal and relational than we realize. That is, shame and its opposite, honor, always have something to do with other people. We experience, experience honor when we are associated with honorable people. We experience shame when we are identified with the shameful. If you think about just even how shame operates in that way. I mean, previously for this woman, I mean, her association was just with her condition, right? I have a discharge of blood. I'm associated with this. Like, I'm just shameful. But here is this woman turning to Jesus in faith. She becomes associated with Jesus. And what happens? It's not that Jesus becomes unclean. The opposite happens, right? Jesus makes her clean. Her source of shame is literally taken away. I mean, that's good news for this woman. I mean, this is good news for us. And, and I want you to think about just what Jesus continues to do. He doesn't let her just disappear back into the crowd, right? It's not just about physical healing because if she just touches the edge of the robe, gets healed, goes on and moves on with her life, you think like, hey, that's a, great, that's a great ending. But you realize like it's not just about the physical healing because Jesus stops, and then what does he do? He literally says, who was it that touched me? But Jesus is up to something. He doesn't let this woman just disappear back into the crowd. You know, and Peter's like, remember, they're, they're moving with the crowd, and, and Peter's like, what are you talking about? Everybody is touching you. 
You know, it reminds me of even when we were in Korea this past November. Um, the, the timing and the plans made it such where we ended up going down into the subway like during rush hour, like at 8 o'clock or whenever it was in the morning. If you've ever been to subway rush hour, that sort of thing, I mean, it's, I thought it was going to be crazy. I mean, it was worse than crazy, right? It's like Asher lost his hat and one of his shoes as we were getting to the subway. We came out and we're like, where's one of your shoes? Like, it was that bad. I mean, you literally get swept up. Right? You're standing in line, and once the doors open, it's just like, it's like a Black Friday rush. Everyone's getting in, everyone's getting pushed in. Can you imagine how ridiculous it would sound if I'm like, Bora, like, who's touched me? <laughs> right? It's like, everybody is touching you. Everybody is touching Jesus. And yet, I mean, he doesn't let it go. He's like, who touched me? It's not that he's oblivious. They're, what's Jesus doing? And what he's bringing to the surface is that it's not about encountering Jesus without being known. It's not about encountering Jesus without being known. Jesus wants to make clear that it's about encountering him and being known by him. It's not about mysteriously kind of coming into some, a place like church and kind of experiencing Jesus in some way and then slipping away and being unknown. It's not about just kind of getting close enough to Jesus to experience something positive and then sort of moving on with your life. What Jesus wants to make clear, even to this woman, is it's about encountering me and being known by me. The woman, she, say, she sees that, okay, Jesus isn't going anywhere. He literally stopped. He's waiting for her to come forward. She comes trembling, right? It says in verse 47. I mean, she's lived a, a life full of shame, 12 years. Maybe she's wondering, like, maybe Jesus is going to, like, shame me in front of everybody. Uh, you know, maybe she thought, dude, I was just looking for the physician, and this is the best physician. He actually healed me. Maybe she was ready to move on with her life. But she comes forward, tells everybody what happened, and did you catch how Jesus responds to her? He says, daughter. He says, daughter. Physicians don't talk like that. It'd be weird if you went to go see a doctor and they're like, son, <laughs> daughter. Physicians don't talk like that. Here's this woman, unclean, an outcast for 12 years, rejected for 12 years, and she comes and Jesus calls her. Jesus of all people, the Jesus that everyone's following, that this whole crowd is following, stops and calls her daughter. Like, I can't imagine how life-giving that must have been, transformative. Her condition it no longer defined her. And if you think about Jesus calling her daughter, I mean, like, and him, Jesus really wanting this woman to slow down. It's, he wanted to know, make sure the woman knew, like, I see you. I see your shame. And I accept you. I mean, there's beauty there. There's beauty there where, where someone like Jesus, we spend so much time, so much energy trying to cover up our shame. We're drowning in it. And here is Jesus saying, I see you. I see your shame. And I accept you. I mean, that's what people filled with shame need to hear. Those who are guilty need to hear that they are forgiven. Those who are filled with shame need to know that they are accepted. And that's what Jesus is doing. He's showing this woman, you are accepted. You are no longer defined by your condition. I've taken it away. And it's more than that, right? Like, I know you, daughter. She's now associated and identified with Jesus. And, you know, this is so imperative for us as we come here. Because even for myself, I always thought, like, if I feel ashamed, then I have shame. But the way that I kind of grew up, the way that I associate with shame, it can sometimes be without all the emotions and feelings attached. I would imagine that for some of you, the feelings and the emotions, it's very real and very tied to the shame uh, that you feel. Maybe it's from the past. Maybe it's from the present. 
But it's so important for us as we think about how Jesus interacts with this woman that it's not about just continuing to live with your shame and in your shame. Sometimes you tell yourself, I am dirty, so you know what? I don't deserve anything good. Some people continue to live with shame in that way. You feel ashamed, you're full of shame, so you think, you know what? I am dirty. I am unclean. I don't deserve things that are good. And you end up self-sabotaging and pushing people away, pushing certain good things away. And some people can live with shame in that way. Some people, they say, you know what? I act or I feel unclean. I feel dirty, so I'm going to act like it. They sort of double down. Some of us, we just spend so much time trying to prove to ourselves to, and to others that, no, let me, let me show you this good side. Let me prove to myself and to others that the shame is not there. And we spend so much time and energy, many years, trying to cover it up. But as we look to this woman, do you realize it's about coming to Jesus in faith? It's about coming to Jesus in faith and through faith having Jesus making you clean. It's about having Jesus accepting you, telling you as you come to him through faith, son, as you come to Jesus through faith, him calling you daughter, being accepted by Jesus. He takes away your shame. He did it on the cross. Think about taking away the things that are unclean and shameful. He bore that shame on the cross, but it didn't end there. You know, you look at places in 1 John 2, it says, you know, when you sin, we have an advocate with the Father. When you feel ashamed for whatever reason, Jesus is not ashamed to be by your side, to be your advocate. He works to take away your shame even now. And the beauty is as he gives you his spirit in Romans 8, it talks about how the Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. You guys remember that verse? But even then, reminding you, you are accepted by God in Christ. The Holy Spirit does that work as it bears witness even with your spirit. Jesus truly is the healer of shame. And if, if I think about just the, the, the depth and the breadth of how Jesus heals this woman, it doesn't even end with him just individually encountering and, and dealing and interacting with her and then moving on. There's another aspect to the healing that Jesus provides. I, I don't know if you caught, but think about this woman again. An outcast for 12 years. She was unclean. Everything she touched became unclean. Everybody knew it. Everybody knew this woman. But notice in verse 47 what happens when Jesus calls her out. It says that she declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. Do you realize that even in calling this woman out, it's not only about him telling her that he accepts her, accepts her but do you see how he's publicly restoring her back into the community? He's literally allowing her to make a testimony in front of all the people who were there, the entire crowd, saying, I've been healed. It's really giving her a path, to, a path forward to be restored. Back in community, back in fellowship with others. And so if you think about even the path of, of being restored from shame, even for yourself, it, it is including this encounter and interaction with Jesus, being accepted by God and in through faith, through Jesus. But do you realize it's not just an individualistic experience? I mean, the path forward when you're being restored from shame, it, it really has to happen in community in relation to others as well. And that, that means there's a huge implication even for us as a church. You know, that would be my hope and prayer as we close, is that as, we think about, as you think about dealing with not only your own shame, I mean, think about what we're just considering together today. I mean, you've got to come to Jesus through faith. But it's also coming to others as well in the body of Christ. And if you think about other people coming into the congregation, we don't know their story. We don't know what kind of shame and burdens people are carrying. But do you realize that as a church, what an opportunity we have to receive people 
who are being restored from shame, people who are being healed from shame, to be able to love them with the love that we've received from Christ. Do you realize what a privilege that is? To be able to point even others to Christ in this way. Living faith, let's resolve and commit to being this sort of a community where those who are filled with shame can find healing, where those who are filled with shame can find acceptance even in the body of Christ. Amen. Let me pray for us. Father, as we think about the presence of sin, the effects of sin, Lord God, every single one of us is touched by shame in some way. Maybe, Lord God, we're, we're dealing with it in full force, Lord God, and, and maybe it feels like a tidal wave, Lord God. Maybe for some of us it feels uh, residual, like the aftershocks, Lord God, of shame as we're trying to move forward. But Lord, as, as we've considered in your word, Lord, help us not to think about how we can move forward apart from you. Lord, help us to see that it's not about moving forward, Lord God, without community. Lord, through your Holy Spirit, Lord, help us to see how, Lord, the deepest desires of our heart is to be known by you. And so, Lord God, help us to come to you in faith, even with the smallest of faith. Lord God, help us to come to you in faith. And Lord God, help us as a community, Lord God, to be able to receive others also in faith as we try to share the love that you've shown us. And so, Father, Lord, won't you do that work in our hearts, And here at Living Faith, and we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.